Jesus Christ is risen. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. Every word of honor that can come out of your mouth, he is worthy of it. He's worthy of every song that you can belt out today. He is worthy of the most over-the-top expressions of thanksgiving and praise. No one compares to him. No one comes close. No one is who he is, and no one has done what he has done. There is no higher thought than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There is no one who could accomplish what he accomplished. There is no one who loves you more than he loves you. And there is no one who could prove love the way he did. We're here to worship him, the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our precious Lord. Will you stand and bow with me in prayer? Jesus, as we celebrate your resurrection this morning, we remember your selfless sacrifice that made the resurrection necessary, even as it made the resurrection possible. We acknowledge the sin in our lives and the wrath that was upon us for it. We thank you for taking our sin to the cross. You died our death. You paid our debt in full. We stand humbled and overwhelmed by your love for us. We worship you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy to be praised. Amen. Will you join with us as we sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that we should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How Thank you. You may be seated. Love the nation. Hana hayau le ahodo. Dat malan ina natu mashicha bara dehaleha. 
Anea Na. Good
Our first scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 20. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Hope gives us confidence to live boldly with peace, knowing that the outcome is all good. That's what hope does. But what do we hope in? The source of hope is crucial. For anyone counting on government leaders or academics or scientists or economists to bring in a better world, you have a track record of absolute failure. If this world system can't bring peace on Earth, even less can mankind's best and brightest guarantee you peace, life after Earth. There's only one true hope, the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus died. But what death did to Jesus was nothing compared to what he did to death. He conquered it. Our hope for eternal life is absolutely guaranteed by the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this certainty, this hope of eternal life, it's offered to all who believe in him, and that makes him worthy of praise. We're going to sing right now a song about hope, Christ our hope in life and death. Sing and dance. 
I suppose all of us know the grief of loss. Loved ones to whom we are endeared have passed from this life and into the arms of Jesus. My father was one of those. Last July 18th, my dad went home to glory. I rejoice in that, but the grief is real. In that sorrow, the Lord led me to a song which reoriented my perspective. And it was written to those who are left below with the truth that real comfort can be found in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we die, we will be raised, be reunited with all those who've passed on before. But as I listen to the next song that we're going to sing, I Will Rise, the Lord seemed to say, hear it from a different perspective. Don't sing it as though you were singing it. Sing it as though your dad were singing it. Hear it as a testimony to what he is now experiencing in my presence. Considering the song in this way profoundly ministered to my soul in a deep way. Joy overflowed the banks of grief. Because Jesus conquered death, so has my dad conquered death. And for all of you who have lost loved ones in Jesus Christ, they've conquered death too. And if you're in Christ, you will conquer death and you'll be in their presence with the Lord forever. That's hope. That's joy. All who are in Christ Jesus shall be raised. And that's the declaration of this next song. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing with us, I Will Rise.
seated. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To a, from a, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
Would you stand if you are able as we read from God's word? This will be out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You may be seated. Can't fit. 
Thank you, ladies. We are blessed to have them lead us in worship and youth group each week. So thank you. Thank you to the choir today. Uh, we've been spending some time this morning uh, looking at uh, the question of whether Christ is worthy or not. Um, and I, I think that's a critical question for us to ask. And I think it's uh, a question that the world is asking uh, all the time, especially uh, this time of year. The question of, of why is Jesus worthy becomes uh, critically important. I think when we look around, you will see all kinds of things uh, in, on TV, in the news, on the internet uh, about Jesus. When we get to this time of year, everybody knows that uh, this holiday at least has something to do with him. And, and why? Why all of this? Uh, why all of this talk about this guy? Why all this music and worship and holidays and all of this? Uh, why is Jesus worthy? And I think uh, the world tries to give a lot of different answers. Uh, some would say that he was a great teacher. Um, uh, but oftentimes, they make him out to be not much more than a Jewish man from the first century uh, that took a stand against the cultural norms of his day. Um, kind of uh, like the first in a long line of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, people that, that we see around today. And he was just kind of uh, somebody who kicked that idea off. Um, but we, what we see in Scripture is that Jesus was so much more than that. Uh, and we see uh, over and over throughout Scripture uh, descriptions of why Jesus is worthy. And I think uh, one of the, the best summaries, or one of the clearest, uh, was written 700 years before he came, and that is uh, found in Isaiah chapter 53. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Isaiah 53 with me. We're going to read through this chapter together. <clears throat> Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look at him, nor an appearance that we should take pleasure in him. He was despised and abandoned by men, a man of great pain and familiar with sickness. And like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we had no regard for him. However, it was our sickness that he himself bore, and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the wrongdoing of my people, to whom the blow was due? And his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. For he will bear their wrongdoings. Therefore, I will allot with him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was counted with the wrongdoers. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the wrongdoers. 
That is why Jesus is worthy. Jesus isn't worthy because of uh, a holiday or uh, teaching or traditions. He's worthy because God of the universe came as a human being for one purpose, to die for us, to die for our sin. And we see in Scripture over and over again the declaration of, of how he's worthy. Our Scripture reading this morning uh, came from Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and starting at verse 9, it says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because he's worthy, that's the kind of glory he's going to receive. Whether anyone likes it or not, that's what's going to happen. But we, when we look at Scripture, what we see over and over again is uh, Jesus' worth because of what he did, because of what he did on the cross, because of the sacrifice he was willing to make for us. He is worthy of every bit of praise that we can offer. But we see that there's a response that is demanded of us as a result of it. Uh, if, if we continue on in this passage in uh, Philippians, when it says that every uh, tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of, the, of God the Father, it goes on to say, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or arguments, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly to the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I can take pride, because I did not run in vain nor labor in vain." But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. What we're going to find over and over again through Scripture is that because Christ is worthy, because of what he's done, we have to come to a place where we respond as a result of that. There, there are so many therefores and so thens and because of this uh, in Scripture. We find this over and over again. And I actually had a hard time uh, uh, this morning narrowing down the, the passages uh, that, that I was going to use because uh, in essentially every one of the epistles, uh, the writers of Scripture spend time telling us about how incredible Jesus was, why he is worthy what he came to do and how he provided grace and mercy for us when we are so undeserving. But because of that, we have to respond. We respond because when we recognize the worthiness of Jesus, it also points out so clearly how unworthy we are. And it becomes necessary to really recognize our unworthiness before him. As we look at uh, passage after passage in Scripture uh, that reflect this idea of what Christ has done, uh, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bend my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Every time we see the picture of what Christ has done for us and we see this incredible uh, realization of his sacrifice uh, and, and his worthiness, it pushes us towards a response. We see it in these passages that uh, our, our response in Philippians chapter 2, do all things without complaining or arguing so that we can prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent. We see in this passage in Ephesians chapter 3, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing one another in love. We are called to look like Christ. We're called to reflect Him. He's the one that's worthy, and so if we're going to respond in any way, it's, it's a response of trying to live like Him, to look like Him. Uh, a few weeks ago, Pastor Tim was preaching out of Romans chapter 12, uh, and I don't think there's a better passage in Scripture to describe uh, this idea and, and what we're, we're looking at here today. Uh, we've also been covering this passage in our youth group, and, <clears throat> and when you go through the book of Romans, Paul has just spent uh, the first half of the book explaining uh, the incredible uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's plan for salvation. Uh, he starts off with the brokenness, wretchedness, fallenness of humanity, and how we deserve nothing uh, but damnation for uh, our sin. But then we see that the, the grace that's offered through Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he's made, and we struggle through this, um, but in chapter 8, we kind of hit the high point uh, where we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, through him who loved us, and nothing can separate us from his love. It's an incredible uh, section of Scripture where we see uh, what Jesus has done and we see how incredibly worthy he is. And then after a couple of chapters dealing with some uh, theological uh, issues uh, and God's sovereignty, we, we shift to chapter 12 where Paul gives us the response. If that was true, if you believe this, if you recognize who Jesus is and what he's done, then there's only one response to make. In Romans 12, uh, starting at verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we see here that if you truly understand who Jesus is and what he's done, if we say that he's worthy, if you recognize that, if you recognize how worthy he is, there's only one response that makes sense. Pastor Tim mentioned this uh, in his message uh, when it says your spiritual service of worship, uh, the, the terms there really mean your rational, reasonable uh, response. That's what it's talking about. So when Paul says this, he says that because of this, therefore, if this is true, then you present yourself as a living sacrifice because that's the only thing that makes sense. 
It's the only response that works. It's the only thing um, that if we recognize who Jesus is and what he's done, it's the only thing that you can do. And it's giving up everything. You're giving yourself up like a sacrifice the way Jesus sacrificed himself for you on that cross. We have the ability to conquer sin and death because he conquered it on the cross, because he rose from the grave. And so we don't have to be conformed into this image that the world uh, gives us, that mold that the world keeps trying to press us into. But we can be transformed because of the work of the Spirit in our lives, because of what Jesus has done. The next verse, verse 3, says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And I think it's interesting how in so many of these passages, we saw the same thing in Philippians and, and in Ephesians, you see that this is followed up with this idea of humility. We can't get to this place uh, that we need to come to without humbling ourselves, without recognizing who we are in the face of God. If you recognize the worthiness of God, you will recognize how short you fall from that standard. Recognizing your wretchedness, brokenness, sinfulness before an almighty God is critical. You cannot offer yourself as a living sacrifice to Him without humbling yourself first and foremost before God. And if you truly understand who Jesus is, how worthy He is, that's the only response that makes sense. And as you realize that, you then humble yourself before others. And we create this incredible body that he talks about in the following passages. So as we look at this today, we see how there is nothing more worthy than Jesus Christ. This moment that we're celebrating today is where he demonstrated that uh, in, in the most incredible way. And there's only one response that we can make that makes any sense, and it's giving our lives completely over to him. First Peter chapter 2, Peter says this, starting at verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls." So, Lord, I pray that each one of us has entrusted ourselves to you who judges righteously. Father, uh, we know that you are worthy. You are worthy of all our glory, all our praise. And we are so wretched and we are so worthless before you. But for some reason, you find us worthy of dying, of paying this incredible penalty that we could never pay. Father, we pray that you help us not to stray from what you've called us to. We pray that we are able to walk in your steps. We pray that we are able to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. God, I pray that you help us uh, to do that. For those in here uh, who haven't recognized how worthy you are, who have not recognize your glory, your truth. I pray that you make yourself known to them today. 
so that the only reasonable response, the only thing that makes sense is to turn their lives over to you. I pray that for each of us in here today. We love you, and uh, we just thank you for who you are. We praise you that you are worthy. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Feel the world is broken. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that we could see?
is he worthy of this? says my king is the king of the Jews he's a king of Israel he's the king of righteousness he's the king of the ages he's the king of heaven he's the king of glory he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords that's my king I, I wonder do you know him <laughs> my king is a sovereign king no means of measure can define his limitless love He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Amen. Stand with me as we crown him with many crowns, as we sing this blessed anthem of our Easter Resurrection Sunday. Crown him with many crowns.
our service the same way we began it. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Praise God. Go in the grace and the favor, the hope and the joy of the resurrection. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.